Excellent, excellent, excellent. And I enjoy your uh, ministry as you worship the Lord with your instruments. It's definitely biblical, and I'm glad that you guys do it. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And Pastor Brett, thank you. And by the way, Stevie Ellingson has got to be one of the greatest acoustic guitar players in the absolute nation. I don't know if you realize how, how good he is, but he is amazing. And, uh, um, well, I was gone last week. How many of you weren't in church last week? Uh, you were not. You were not here. Not here. I wasn't either. And I was... I never had spent just a week just with my daughter without my wife there or my son or her family. And uh, that week was special because of spending that time. It was really awesome. And so I was live streaming and missed part of it because it kept having trouble with my reception from the internet or whatever that was going on. But I caught one thing. Austin had false doctrine. so I didn't, I wouldn't, if I'd have known he was going to tell stories I, I, and bring me up in this whole thing, I wouldn't ask him to preach on Father's Day. I had no clue that's what he was going to do. And the, the story about Kansas City Worlds of Fun with my baseball team was a little misconstrued. <laughs> First, I did not tell him to get the girl's number. <clears throat> Secondly, the ride had not started. They were on the ride. The girl dropped her shoe that you put your toes through like this <laughs> down below the ride. When I grew up, that was called a thong. And I was yelling, and I got louder and louder because no one was responding like I was invisible. Her thong is down there. I kept yelling louder and louder. And a woman about 10 or 12 years younger than me tapped me on the shoulder said, Sir, I'm just enough younger to know, and but old enough to remember when those kinds of shoes were called that, but now those are string underwear, and now they're called flip-flops. And I went, flip-flop, flip-flop, that's what I meant, flip-flop. And the people right around me started laughing, but the kids never acknowledged that I existed, not a one of them. <laughs> These, and the, the part he left out that's the meanest thing that happened there was I was waiting up at the end of the ride because I didn't want to ride that thing, and I was waiting up at the exit, and five of my baseball players came off that ride and ran right by me. I'm talking to them, and they didn't walk. They ran, and I could not keep up with them, and I didn't see them for hours. And here I am. What are you going to do when you're an old guy walking around Kansas City Worlds of Fun? I'm all by myself, so I just went and ate. Yeah, all is right. Ate, ate french fries and whatever else, so that's that story. I hope you had a good Father's Day. I hope that what you didn't miss in that sermon is that it's the responsibility of parents to evangelize and disciple your own children. The church can only supplement that. Do you understand that? There is no way, even if you're here Sunday morning and Sunday school and Sunday night, Wednesday night, extra events, there's even camp. There is no way in our secular society you're going to raise children that will walk with God and be fruitful for God and be strong for the Lord unless you are intentional about teaching your children the word and the truth. You have to make a point to make your home a place of Christian education and discipleship. And it can't be just a 15-minute reading at a dinner table. It has to be all day long. And you pour it in and pour it in and pour it in and pour it in and tell them and tell them and tell them and give it to them and give it to them. The Beatitudes, the fruit of the Spirit, the, 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 the truth of God's grace. And, and throughout the Scripture, the, when they start little, the, reading the stories of the Old Testament and teaching them the Bible, it, you have to be intentional. So please do that. It's very important. I urge you. Because, uh, you know, while we'll do all we can, it's not enough. And so we are here to supplement. Hey, I am the chairman of the Urbandale Fourth July Parade. And um, I, I have these buttons. I'm supposed to sell some of them. And, I, I, and they really loved y'all because last year you bought a bunch of them. And the way we did it was just gave some money. And I said, if you want a button, go pick one up. So I got a 20. This year they went from three to five because it's the 100-year centennial, you know, for Urbandale. And so I'm going to, if I could have some guys help me, we're going to take some money here. And then instead of taking money up and giving it to the event center, do I have some guys that are going to help me? 
did the early ushers not tell you? Well, those guys. So anyway, uh, I've got, I've got, I'm getting four of them right here, and I'm going to give them to people. When, when it's all over, you want one, honey? Here, you two guys, you want one? Okay, when it's all over, there's a number on those buttons, and you look online, and they give, businesses give prizes. Some of them are worth 35 to 50 bucks, 100 bucks. You can win things. So when you take those, keep them to the end after the fourth, go online, they draw numbers, and then the winners are there. So anyway, but what you're doing is, yeah, let's we'll see, your number is, uh, you're 633. Lord, let 633 win something big, amen. So... Anyway, if you don't have a $5 bill, you can give a dollar or two or three, whatever. And if you don't want a button, that'll help us be able to bless that committee. Because this is all volunteers. It's not the city. It's guys like me. So that's just the way it is. Take your Bible. <clears throat> turn to Practical Holy Spirit Living, chapter 1 Corinthians 12. Practical Holy Spirit Living. I have three p- parts of this sermon that I am doing the first one. And on the practical side of spiritual gifts today, I'll be doing a spiritual walk next year, out of next Sunday out of Galatians chapter five, and then later spiritual fruit. Um, I did a very fast moving sermon on tongues that you need to go back and listen to. Tongues meaning spiritual language, a Holy Spirit language that that happens. And and I want to I want to start off because of the matter of spiritual gifts. I want to start off with um, talking about that just a little bit and clarifying and re retouching on on uh, some of it. I had a person that's never been in a church. He's about sixty. Come up to me after this morning service. He was in early service and tell me he'd been in church for most of his life. He's never heard anyone teach on this and. All, to really help you understand and be clear and stay biblical. And uh, he really appreciated it. And I would say that, you know, it's hard to cover this subject in one message. And I don't know how many have missed different messages, but I've been talking about the Holy Spirit for a few weeks. So if you could go online and you can hit live stream and then a whole page comes up and there is a catalog of all of the last sermons you can pull up and watch and you can slide over if you don't want to wait through the worship time that's also on there to the message and listen and watch. So hopefully that'll help you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we'll start there first. <clears throat> and it's not on the screen uh, unless, oh, uh, Tammy heard me do it this morning, so she changed it around for me. Thank you, Tammy. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, he, he comes out of chapter 13, and he's really correcting what the, the fruit of the Spirit and what the heart of every believer that's full of God and full of God's Spirit, uh, he's correcting this thing of, of, it was really pretty fleshy. It's pretty much about us. Uh, and that's what was going on in the Corinthian church. And by the way, the Corinthian church, the Corinthians, they met in a synagogue. The, the Christians, early Christians were Jewish and they were in a synagogue. In typical Jewish synagogue service, the men were on one side and the women were on another. And this week I read an article by an active uh, rabbi uh, who is in Australia, actually. He was explaining the practical reasons why they worshiped with men on one side and women on the other. Is the distraction how different men and women are and the distraction of men being by women and also that some people are single and when your couples are sitting together and a single person is sitting there, whether it's a man or a female, it kind of makes them stand out. And so the men would sit on one side and the women would sit on the other side. And, uh, and, and uh, what was happening is there was a lot of confusion and everybody was going, look at this new thing that I can do. I can talk in tongues. They'd get up and talk in tongues and someone else would get up and talk in tongues. Somebody else would get up and talk in tongues or they'd be doing it over each other. And the, whoever was leading the, the service, they would have a prophecy. Somebody would say something that they could understand and, and, and then the, the, the wives would <clears throat> talk to their husbands ac- across the aisle. And that's why it says to, for women to be silent in the church. Be- the reason it said that is not that women and men are, are equal, but it was because that there was confusion and they were yelling across to their husbands. That's why it says, wait till you get home. If you have a question to discuss it, do it that way. So it wasn't putting down women in any way. In fact, the Bible says in Christ Jesus as the church, there's no Greek, no Jew, no slave, no free, and, and no male and no female. 
And uh, if you'll remember, Paul appointed and left women in charge of many of the early churches. They were the pastors of the churches. So don't think for a minute that God uh, is a sexist. He's not. He's, he's not a feminist either. <clears throat> he's a person that loves every human being the same and equal. Uh, so there was confusion, and the everyone was had these new spiritual gifts, but they weren't being considerate. Their heart wasn't to prefer others in love. It was like, look at me. Look what I can do, playing spiritual king of the mountain, as it were. And there was chaos and order. That's why the last verse in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians says, let everything be done decent and in order. Okay? So, he talks about love, no matter if you talk in tongues, you have all knowledge, you have all wisdom, factor 13. He said, if you don't have love, it's all just a bunch of noise. It's worthless. Remember, that is the singular fruit of the Holy Spirit is God love. The number one and two results of the fullness of God in his spirit in our life is love and holiness. His first name is Holy Spirit and that it affects your behavior because it takes this word and it's sharp like a two-edged sword. And the Bible says this Bible, the word of God, is the sword of the Holy Spirit. And that sword is to cut so that the flesh is cut and our humanity and our selfishness is cut so that we don't live selfish what we want. We live according to what God wants to please God. Are you with me? And so holiness to live as God would want us to live, to honor God, to please God, to follow his commands, to have the power of the spirit to live so, so forth by the fullness of his spirit and love. And love has sub fruits. Love is shown in kindness and patience and goodness and gentleness, et cetera, correct? So he gets to chapter 14 and he says, after he gets through really kind of saying, he's really kind of saying, I don't care how many of these gifts you have, that I just talked about and I'm gonna talk about in a minute in chapter 12. If you don't have love, you don't have anything. But he, he don't have anything if you don't have love. It's worthless, these gifts. But he comes right back and then he says, but, he says, earnestly desire, follow the way of love, but eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Why especially prophecy? Because the reason the Spirit exists is to flow through you a supernatural purpose to use your giftings and your uniqueness to touch and bless others, to lift up and encourage and bless others. When it talks about what prophecy is for, we'll see, looking at, uh, well, let, let's just go to, well, it says especially the gift of prophecy because the, the point Paul's making all through here is that when the gifts of the Spirit are in operation in a practical sense, it's to help and bless other people. Our hearts need to look out. It's not to make us look good. That's not the point. And so he says, for anyone who speaks in tongues does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. Verse two, he utters mysteries with his spirit. In other words, his spirit is praying and it's a mystery even to him what he's saying. If you have a spiritual language, the antiquated word for language is tongues. Uh, you have a spiritual language the Holy Spirit's given the language, you're speaking it, you don't even understand it. It's a mystery by the Spirit that you utter, not by the mind. The mind is unfruitful. The Spirit gives the words, you don't understand it, no one else understands it, unless it be for a special purpose as a declaration to the unbeliever that you speak a language you don't know. Now, I've had missionary friends tell me that they've heard people in their mission land speak English that didn't know English, and it was interpreted, they understood it, and heard it interpreted in the, t the foreign tongue of the, of the land that they were missionaries to, and it was interpreted correctly in essence. Interpretation of Scripture is not, is not a word-for-word -word translation. It's in essence what was said. And in all of these gifts, there's a mixture of our humanity and our personality that comes out. Therefore, you know, God's not going to, like, if I gave a word from the Lord, I might say y'all, but Jesus, when he was on earth, was a Hebrew, and he wouldn't have had the same words, or wouldn't have been speaking in English, and he wouldn't have sounded like a Texan because Jesus wasn't from Texas, even though the Texans don't know that. <laughs> I'm the only one that knows that. 
It's only because Iowa has delivered me. But anyway, <laughs> but notice it says if you speak in a tongue, it doesn't speak to men but to God. When you speak to God, that's prayer. And you speak to God, that's prayer. And Paul jumps over, if you look over with me, that in uh, verse 14, verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 14, for this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. You see that? There's, and notice it calls it praying in, in a tongue. There's the main purpose. But my mind is unfruitful. My, my understanding, I don't understand. I'm praying in the spirit, so, I, I'm un, uh, so I'm not lying to you. It says it right there. So what shall I do? Here's what you do. You pray with the spirit, but I'll also pray with my mind. In other words, I'll pray with words that I, I understand with my mind, but I'll pray with spiritual language that the Holy Spirit gives with my spirit. I'll also uh, sing with my spirit, the spiritual language, but also sing with my mind. We sing, we worship. So Holy Spirit language that God gives us helps us to be able to pray and also worship in, in, in the spirit realm that's deeper and more powerful. And notice that it says, he that speaks in a tongue, verse four of 1 Corinthians 14. Well, let's go back to verse three. I missed, I missed that one. 1 Corinthians 14, three. Everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening and encouragement and comfort. And that's the point Paul is making in chapter 14. All these supernatural things that are going on and these supernatural spiritual gifts, they're to, they're to minister to others. It's not about you. It's not so that you get some benefit. When you pray by yourself in a spiritual language, you're getting built up. But when you come together in a group, don't just be selfish and sit there and build yourself up because people around you that don't know what's going on, they're confused. If everybody in the room has a spiritual language, then go ahead and everybody pray it. But here's what happens if I were to say to this group, let's all pray in our spiritual language. And half of you don't have your spiritual language. Those of you that don't feel left out, like what am I supposed to do? Right? It makes you feel bad, like something wrong with me? No, there's nothing wrong with you. You can pray with understanding. You can sing with understanding. You can pray with spirit. You can sing with spirit. Not that God doesn't want to, to bless you with, with, a, with a spirit language. I think, I think he does. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But notice verse, verse three really talks about why, why he says, especially pursue the gift of prophecy in verse one, because it helps others, and we need to be mindful of others. It strengthens, encourages, and comforts. Verse four, and first Corinthians 14 said, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. That sounds bad, doesn't it? Well, if you jump to verse five, that's 4a, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. He that speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but I would like every one of you speaking. Go back to verse four. Verse four says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. In verse five again, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. He's not saying don't do it, but we're talking about when we're together as a church, it needs to make a difference and be understood. I'd rather have you prophesy. For he who prophesies is greater than he that speaks in tongues unless he interprets, because when you give the interpretation, now you use the mind, you're giving what was being said so that the church may be edified to everyone. This chapter is clearly talking about public worship. It's talking about the public use of the gifts. It's talking about the confusion in a gathering like this of people. Everybody have a tongue? Every, one place it says later in chapter 14, everybody's got a tongue, everybody's got a prophecy, everybody got a word, everybody got this, everybody got that. Everybody doing their own thing and there's no order. And he's saying, these are all good, but make sure that everything is done, thinking of others, preferring others, and for the edification and encouragement and exhortation and the building up of, of the other. So I believe in praying in the Holy Spirit language that the Holy Spirit gives, and I believe with praying with my understanding, worshiping with Holy Spirit language, and, and, uh, and also with the words like we did today that we understand. And um, I, I wanna now turn, if you will with me, turn to 1 Corinthians 12, go back a couple of chapters, and we'll start at verse four. And I want you to see something, because in chapter 12, he talks about tongues, interpretation of tongues, for in the church. In chapter 14, he's obviously talking about in the church, speak words they understand and use your tongues privately, right? He's saying, because it builds you up. He says, I want you to all the pray in tongues, but in the church, 
use words they understand, to edify, to teach, to build up, right? Isn't it clear? There we go. So chapter 12, though, look at it. It says, verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now, this is the practical Holy Spirit living of spiritual gifts. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. And to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit, now look at this, is given for the common good. The King James says, is given to every man to profit with all. In other words, that everyone would be benefited for the common good. Notice that's what's supposed to happen when we gather together, when the Holy Spirit gifts work together like this. And in our community, it also, when it functions that way. So if that's the case, if it's to be for the common good for everyone, then when we gather together like this, we need to have things that people can understand. And that's why in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, it, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that if you, he would rather you prophesy, if a man speaks in tongues, it should be interpreted, but rather I just have you prophesy like what happened today, just the word understanding. And so it's tongues and interpretation together, hand in hand, is good because they're both gifts and there's reasons why it could happen and should happen and happen, just like on the mission field and like on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two. There's reasons why those things happen. Now, I wanna show you. When it says there's different kinds of gifts, the same spirit, different kinds of service, the same spirit, and different kinds of working, the same God, it works all in verses number four, five, and six. What I wanna explain to you, as someone was sharing with me this morning, I thought it was perfect, is that just like the Holy Spirit love, the power of love in our life, it works through different ones of us differently. We're all wired a little bit emotional differently. When the Holy Spirit is on us, it might look different. I cry. When the Holy Spirit's heavy, I just cry. One time I started laughing, and there's nowhere in the Bible that I know of, tell me if there is, where it says, talks about, quote, laughing in the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit was on me, and I was laughing, and before long, everyone was laughing, and I know it was God that gave great joy because it's one of the fruit of the Spirit is joy, and yet I'm not gonna manufacture some sort of laugh, laugh in, so to speak, quote unquote, laugh in. That's kind of funny, isn't it? And so, so but, the, but, but, but that's a reaction of my humanity to that. There's nothing wrong with that. Some people get excited and, and shout or jump up and down or, you know, or get real like demonstrative and others are very quiet and still, but it doesn't mean they're not moving in their heart. And even if you're the type person that thinks you're tone deaf and during songs you're not singing, you can sing the song, the words, and focus from your heart. You can express them to God and enjoy the music and still worship God. Uh, don't just check out when you don't sing. Worship with your heart. It, it, don't, 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 don't lose out on the moment to express yourself to God through music. Um, and so... Uh, the, when it talks about these manifestation things, it's like when I love, I love out of relationship. I love out with words. I love with watching over people and checking on people and encouraging people and caring about people. But not everybody is outgoing and crazy like me. And like, for instance, the guys that yesterday went and helped replace a roof for you guys, that's love in action. And their personality and the way the Holy Spirit works with them is nothing like it does me. And it's just saying, hey, it looks different in different people, so don't be judging each other. We all have a part in the way we do it. And so if you bring a meal to someone who just had a baby or someone that's sick or you go visit the hospital, whatever you do, there's service and there's ministry. It's all spirit-led, spirit-empowered, but it's gonna look different because God has a purpose and a plan through you that well, the Holy Spirit flows through you, and it's the same thing. Now, here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. It's the third person of God. We went over that. God the Father, God Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God, God is supernatural. God is in the natural. He's invisible. He's all-powerful. So he wants us to live supernatural lives, and that's weird. That's spooky. We believe supernatural things that God created the world. We believe in the virgin birth, we believe in many things that are spiritual mysteries that empower. So for the Holy Spirit to do miraculous things like the Bible says it does is, is not that strange. 
Austin mentioned in his message that we were at the hospital. It wasn't that long ago. In fact, I was there with uh, Judy Elder, and, and suddenly I looked over. I just kept noticing this young lady back and forth. She's about 20 years old, and the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and told, gave me a word to go tell her. Now, this is prophecy, like what happened in the church, but this is in the marketplace. It's at the hospital. And he told me that she, she doesn't really feel loved, and she doesn't really feel like she has any value. She doesn't really feel like that she has any beauty to, to behold, and, uh, and that she felt like God didn't love her and that God wasn't with her and that there was no purpose or plan for God's life, for her life from God. And to go tell her all those things, are, give her a word, tell her all that stuff is true. So I, I got up and Austin saw me, I'm go talk to this girl. He said, dad, 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 because I embarrassed him. Well, God didn't tell him. He didn't know that God had told me because I didn't say I got a word from the God. I just got up and went over and gave it to her. She started bawling. And her mother said, oh my goodness, see, I told you. She said, see, all this is exactly what I've been telling you. And it was a confirmation and it had nothing to do with me. Listen, God knew you before the foundations of the world were laid and he has a purpose and a plan for you and this is a supernatural God that lives inside you. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and we serve a supernatural God who knows everything, who has all power, who is everywhere at all times and it's nothing for him to communicate through you by his gifts of the Spirit and to work to bless others and to build them up and to minister to other people. Now, in a practical sense, all of these gifts need to function from one basic element, and that is that we get in tune with God and in tune with his spirit and that we learn to have spiritual antennas and hear from God. In the revelation John received in the letters to the churches, he says over and over to the church, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit would say, let him hear what the Lord by the Spirit says. And let me tell you, to operate in the supernatural, all you gotta do is hear the supernatural voice of God, and guess what? It's not that difficult if you will close out that which you can visually see and hear because the natural world, God is not natural, he's invisible in his spirit, and yes, maybe it's a little spooky, but you close out, you get your antennas up, you begin to commune, you begin to listen, and you don't necessarily hear God say out loud a voice, although people have said they've heard that. I've, I've had God speak to me as real as if it were out loud, but never audible. But some have told me they've heard audible. And there's Bible examples of audible. But he puts impressions on your mind. He comes and he places a thought in your head and you go, well, that's never happened to me. Wait a minute. I'm speaking to somebody right here. Don't say that because you know good and well that you've given money that came to your mind strongly you should give and that was the voice of God. And over here, there's the gift called the gift of giving, Right? And some people are gifted to make money so they can give, and God's Spirit leads them where to give. Because just to give aimlessly is not what God wants. He wants you to give intentional, to live intentional, and being led by the Spirit. We give out of obedience, then we give led by the Spirit. And you'll never make a sacrificial gift unless you hear the voice of the Spirit that leads you to give. Otherwise, you're left at the demise or at the hands of manipulators who want to manipulate your money from you. I'm gonna tell you, there's certain blessings from God that are tough to live with. Beauty, the blessing of money and the intelligence, strength, there's a lot of things. that Anything that humanity would want and desire they will use it, and people aren't to be used, people are to be loved. Now I wanna notice, I want you to know Jack Hayford, and um, gateway guy, uh, Bob, Robert Morris, they both teach this, and I believe it too, that these gifts that I'm gonna read belong to the Holy Spirit, not you. The Holy Spirit doesn't give it to you where it's yours and you can use it anytime you want to. I prayed with Kay Collins, some of you know her, she's a woman that went to Berean, 
And it's the only time I know for sure that the gift of healing flowed through me. But she had been sick and losing weight and they could not, she'd been the doctor after doctor and they could not figure out what was wrong with her. And I, she came to be prayed for and it was an emotional moment. And I came up not like I'd been built up and ready to go and somehow I had my own natural le level of faith way up here and I, I, I was gonna do something for her. I just came up and suddenly the Holy Spirit put in me, I'm gonna heal her. And I just knew it because God's spirit gift was right there to heal and I just knew it. And I prayed for her and I told her, God's gonna heal you. And she was healed. She, went, she never had, she, all the symptoms immediately from that day forward went away. She quit losing weight and they never did find out what was wrong, but she was totally, and it had been going on for a few months. I don't know if any of y'all that, that had went there remember that, but I remember it. It's the only time I know for sure that it was the Holy Spirit gift of healing. If the God gave me the gift of healing in that moment that now was my gift, I could go heal anybody I wanted to any time. See? But the truth is, the gifts are always the Spirit, and He only uses you because He's going to get the glory. But He will use you, and many times, over and over and over in the same area of giftings because He chooses severally as He wills, and He will flow through you these gifts. And it's a practical thing. It's not just for church services. It's all the time. So here they are. Verse seven, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common and good. To verse eight, to one there is given the Spirit of the message or the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom is a message to someone of wisdom. Um, per, perhaps uh, in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit did that when he said, uh, tell them you're gonna saw the baby in half and they can each have half of it. Remember that story? <laughs> yeah. Pretty good wisdom worked out, found out who the real mother was. The real mother was said, no way, give the baby to, to her, you know? Uh, and there, and you don't know wisdom. There's just a supernatural wisdom from God. To another, the message of knowledge. You just know something. You get a word from God that you, you would otherwise not know, just like at the hospital I was telling you about. Or like when we were trying in our own human thinking to come up with what to do next and expanding our facility over there. And we met, and we met the elders, the deacons. We met, we met, and we couldn't figure it out. And God said, stop, I'll tell you when. And suddenly, it just came to me. It just, it was like knowledge. is just what to do was just boom. I just knew it. And it was by the Spirit. God just showed it to me, you know. Um, and then to another, by the same Spirit, to another, it says, uh, faith, by the same Spirit. And that's a supernatural faith or something that is not your natural building up of faith that comes by reading the word, but God supernaturally helps you believe something that's so bigger than, than any man could do. To another, the gifts of healing by the one spirit. Notice it says gifts of healing. I believe that God uses different people to pray for different things. And I do, I do have faith for certain things when people are sick, that when I pray, the Holy Spirit, that God usually heals that. And other things I haven't seen I prayed for and haven't seen God heal them. But I do believe that people aren't healed because some of you don't know that even though you think of yourself as nothing, you got a mighty God in you and, and, and you have a gift that he wants to flow through you. You just need to, to realize it's okay to come pray with someone. And we have a prayer team that prays with people, but we should never not be a spirit-led church where anyone could come and pray with someone because who knows it might be you that the Holy Spirit flows a gift of healing and boom, you lay your hands on them and they're healed, right? All right, so there's different kinds of sickness and there's gifts, plural, healing by the same spirit to another miraculous powers, uh, miracles, things that, you know, yes, healing is a miracle, but there's other kinds of miracles um, to another prophecy and that's speaking the truth under the anointing of the spirit like we talked about. Uh, it could have something to do uh, with something in the future. Um, you know, say, well, is that a word of knowledge or is that prophecy? Why do we want to, like, have to have clear lines? A lot of times these gifts work kind of over like this. Is, was, well, now, was that a word of knowledge? Was that a word of wisdom? Was that faith? Was that a miracle? Was that, oh, who cares, <laughs> right? Be open, let the Holy Spirit flow through you in that gift. And then uh, to another distinguishing uh, uh, between spirits or discernment, and how important is that as a parent? or word of knowledge. There were times I knew things about my kids that God told me. I don't know how I knew them, I just knew them. No one told me. I, didn't, I wasn't being playing suspicious, I just knew them. 
I need to. Parents need these gifts. Holy Spirit led parents. Uh, and are there, as a pastor, being able to distinguish uh, what spirit something is or someone is because you're putting people and approving people in leadership. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one same spirit and gives them to each one just as he determines. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts. And though in all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. Verse 13, we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. In other words, when you were saved, you were baptized into the church and by Jesus Christ, by his spirit, not by infant water baptism. You weren't saved and baptized in the church by water as an infant. You're saved when your heart is gripped by grace. And right here, verse 13, you are baptized by one spirit. You're, you're, you're saved by the spirit of God, one spirit in the body and through Jesus. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Listen, the Holy Spirit is like a drink. He wants to fill you up. The body is made up of one part. Now, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And then it talks about the foot and so forth and so on, right? So he's making this analogy of the eye, the ear. Some of you are eyeballs. Some of you are ears. Some of you are feet. Some of you are a big, ugly, fat toe. And, you know, we're all different things. And it says, and the less honorable parts of the body should be honored. And those that have a reason to be honored, we all rejoice with those that honor. And when you suffer or you're sad, we all weep and with them, right? So we're all a body because it's about unity and love. Remember, that's the central, the focus. But we have these gifts that we can use and we're all just chosen to use them differently. Now here's the problem. Because it talks like this, there's a, toward the end of chapter 12, people believe that it's okay, that God, God just must not want to give me a spiritual language for me to pray in or worship in. I'm telling you, most of you aren't given a spiritual language to utter in this church. In fact, probably very few of you are given a spiritual language to utter as a public utterance to be interpreted. Because we already know what Paul says about that. But Paul says, I would that you all spoke with tongues. He says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than y'all. And the, toward the end of chapter 14, he says, forbid not speaking with tongues. And let me tell you something. Here's where they get it that that you know, well, not everybody's going to be able to do that, and I don't necessarily agree with it. Look at uh, verse uh, 27 now of chapter 12. Now, you are body, part of the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, notice, in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and notice those three, apostles, prophets, teachers. Look at verse 29, the beginning of it. Skip down to 29, Tammy. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? He's talking about in the church. Now go back up to 28 again. And in the church, God is appointed first of apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, those that have the gifts of healing. Never make no much it's plural again. Those able to help others, those with the gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all do work of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? The answer to all that is no, 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 no. In the church. No, in the church, because he's talking about the use of it in the church, okay? But eagerly desire the greater gifts, and now I'll show you the most excellent way, and he's going to talk about love. But Paul, Jesus said, if you need and desire something from your earthly father, if you ask him for bread, would he give you a stone? If you ask him for a fish, will he give you a snake? How much more will he give you of the Holy Spirit? And if to be able to pray in a Holy Spirit heavenly language is a good thing that Paul desires and says he wishes we all had, and to be able to worship and sing with a spiritual heavenly language is, and, to, and to worship in, in, in a heavenly language is a good thing, why wouldn't God give you that language? Now, I want to tell you what I've told you every time I've spoke on this. Don't seek the language, but don't be afraid of it either. And don't believe that, oh, I'm not meant to do that. I've never done that. If God wanted me to do it, I'd do it. Here's my question. Are you seeking God's kingdom first and his righteousness? Are you seeking the fullness of God and more of God? Are you seeking a supernatural God that he can do supernatural things through you? For he said, I go to my Father in heaven. It's good that I go. If I don't go, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. And if he doesn't come to you, you're in trouble. 
But if he does, he'll teach you and guide you in all truth. And we are in such a better place than the Old Testament saints because the God of the universe lives in us by his spirit. And he's with every one of us all the time, not just among us, but in us. And there's great things he can do through simple, ordinary people. If you just knew that within every one of us we have the same insecurities, the same thoughts, the same things, that we can't do things, but we serve a miraculous, supernatural God with the supernatural Holy Spirit in us that can do incredible things. Do you get that? And so those of you that are weary and heavy laden and are, and are burdened, we're going to ask you to come to the altar. Will you all stand with me? And I'm going to invite you to come. And those of you that need forgiveness of sin, I'm going to invite you to come with them. And those of you that need healing, I'm going to invite you to come. And those of you that feel, everybody stand, would you? Everyone everywhere. And musicians come. Anyone that needs to be free from addiction, the addiction of food, of drugs, of alcohol, if you're addicted and you've been trying to quit smoking, I talked to someone this week. I said, I know, my dad, a great Christian, he said, and I, I've read it, heroin's easier to quit than tobacco. But God's Spirit, one person told me this week that when they came to Christ, is about two months ago, they had been chewing tobacco and they tried over and over in their own strength, but when they prayed and they were alone and invited Christ to help them and end their life, that suddenly it was done and no more chewing tobacco. And it's not about the chewing tobacco, it's about the power of God inside. And I'm telling you, if you have something you want to overcome, be free, anything, God is here. 